Yeah, we're really excited to have Sarah Peretsky with us here. Uh, she's one of the uh, people that we're so proud to have in, as a member of our Hyde Park community. And uh, that, that connection to, to the South Side is uh, one of longstanding. After being an undergraduate at the University of Kansas, she came to Chicago in 1966 and was doing community organizing during some of the, uh, the, the race riots. But then her connection to the university, and this is something I didn't know until quite, quite recently, um, is, is a very deep one. She has a PhD from the history department and uh, did a dissertation on the breakdown of moral philosophy in New England before the Civil War. So very closely connected to, to some of the historical themes of the conference. And then she also has an MBA from what's now called the Booth School. So, um, so, so those connections are, are there. But she also is uh, married to a professor of physics in uh, our physics department. So she's lived in Hyde Park for a long time. And we're really so proud of, of her connection to the university. Now, I guess, um, I mean, everyone knows V.I. Warshawski, but I think um, it's still worth saying in terms of this conference what, what is so wonderfully appealing and, and, and marvelous about V.I. as a character and the novels as novels. And I, I think, of course, the detective uh, novel is, is a, a, a genre of great depth and it does explore issues of social justice, but it's often used in a very superficial way in, in the, the issues of justice are, are not genuinely explored. And, and so I think what first thing that I find so wonderful about Sarah's novels is that she really delves deeply into the issues of social justice and um, justice for women, of course, being a central part of it. And she thinks about it in a very complicated way. And moreover, her character also thinks about it, uh, these issues in a complicated way. So this character is a, is a thinking woman and, and, it, and shows that you could be a woman of action and still be person who thinks, person who sings opera, and, and, and so on. So I think this character, uh, who's enormously popular over the whole country, maybe has a special appeal for people who are working on social justice issues and, and, and thinking about them, um, be, just because I think that, that kind of authenticity about the complexity of the issues, you, you really don't find anywhere else in the novel. And uh, Sarah has, uh, is known for doing a lot of research in the legal aspects of the issues. She sometimes consulted with people here from the law school. But I think that makes her sound like she's too much of an academic rather than a novelist. So I, I guess I want to uh, end the, the welcome by mentioning something that she said to an interviewer who asked her what was the best thing about being a writer. And she said, you get to explore a thousand different personalities all by going deep into your own soul. And I think that is really the thing that makes it all uh, work and, and makes it so, so marvelous that, that she really uh, does that. So uh, without further ado, welcome her to explore the themes of gender, law, and the novel in a, in a more wide-ranging and contemporary way. Well, everyone who's spoken here today has worked very hard except me. They've sung, they've acted, they've done deep research on papers. And everyone who's been in attendance here has also worked hard just trying to stay focused for um, a very long time, eight hours now, which I think is a full work day. I think your union will now allow you to charge overtime for listening to me. So if everyone is tired, I would say there are only two words that you really need to remember from what I'm saying this evening, and that's equality myth. It's a wonderful website that's been developed by a group of young women who are writers at Newsweek. And I cherish them. I cherish the site. It kind of keeps me going as I move into my creaky feminist old age. The remarks that I'm going to give tonight are gathered together loosely under the title of Women, Speech, and Silence. If you want to write a bestseller and you're too lazy to think of anything original yourself, you're pretty well guaranteed success if you tamper with Jane Austen, especially with Pride and Prejudice. We've had at least 20 spin-offs in the last few years, including Mr. Darcy's Daughters, Bridget Jones' Diaries, and The Bar Sinister, in which Mr. Darcy has fathered an illegitimate child on the Pemberley estate. <laughs> 
Austin believed Darcy to be a moral and ethical person, but what did she know? <laughs> the newest Austin incubus trumps them all, however. It's pride and prejudice and zombies, and it begins, it's a truth universally acknowledged that a zombie in possession of brains must be in want of more brains. <laughs> I often read works by other writers in which I've been creative enough to think of their structure or to use language with their grace. This particular opening sentence uh, isn't one of those occasions. <laughs> I don't know what it is with zombies, vampires, Jane Austen, and our current age, but every time my husband and I run out of episodes of Due South or NCIS, and like all good Americans, slump back on our couch and channel surf, it seems that our only choices are either reality TV or movies about lesbian vampires from outer space, <laughs> although perhaps those actually are TV docudramas. When I was 11, my older brother gave me Dracula to read. The book terrified me so much that I stopped sleeping. I would lie in bed all night waiting for Dracula to morph into a wolf and crash through my window. We lived in their country. Our nearest neighbors were cows on one side and corn or wheat fields on the other three. Perfect cover for lurking vampire wolves. On one long insomniac night as I peered out my window around 3 a.m., I saw a whole pack of wolves in the vegetable garden behind our house. I screamed so loudly that my parents and all four of my brothers woke and came running. The neighbor's cows had trampled down the fence in the night and were helping themselves to our sweet corn. My father went out to the garden and sent them home with more dispatch than Mr. Darcy slashing a zombie. <coughs> I was a hero of sorts for saving the vegetables, but I never overcame my nighttime fears, my long bouts of insomnia where I imagined the terrors that could be stalking me. And Dracula, frankly, still terrifies me so much that I can't read the book or watch the film versions. I wrote a novel recently called Bleeding Kansas, which is set in the part of Kansas where I grew up. One of the families in it runs a dairy farm. Perhaps someone who couldn't tell the difference between a wolf and a cow had no business writing about dairy farming. It occurred to me far too late in the process of the novel that I should have just written a novel about zombie vampire cows. <laughs> When I was a child and just starting to read and write, my favorite books were set in safe, often magical places. <coughs> the Secret Garden, the Narnia stories, even Little Women showed children in safety, protected by the walled garden, the magic lion, or the wise and loving Marmy. The first stories I wrote were like that too. They were set in secret walled spaces where no dangers, no vampires, no wolves, None of the terrors of the adult world around me could penetrate. I think my lifelong fascination with crime fiction reflects this. I don't like horror stories. I don't like serial killers or rape and dismemberment. I want characters who make me feel safe, however briefly, however illusorily. Perhaps readers respond to V.I. Warshawski for the same reason. She has the same doubts and fears that I have, or that perhaps you have. But unlike me, her doubts don't get in her way of protecting the most vulnerable people around her. When I was growing up, my parents used to call me Sarah Bernhardt. It was not an affectionate name. It reflected their frustration with me for making drama or melodrama out of life. My fear of vampires and my insomnia were signals to my mother that I was once again using histrionics to try to make myself the center of family attention. So when I was around 10, my parents gave me Mark Twain's personal recollections of Joan of Arc to read. They wanted me to see the dire fate that awaited girls who felt life too intensely, who overreacted to the world around them. Unfortunately, reading about Joan of Arc had kind of a kickback effect on me. Her life didn't make me want to retreat to the model of domestic servitude that my parents envisioned for me. 
Instead, I longed for Joan's ardor. I longed for a vision of the magnitude of hers and the strength to execute it. Her death also gave me a lifelong fascination and fear of fire. After Mark Twain, I read about the fires of the Spanish Inquisition and England's bloody Mary Tudor. I still feel my skin turn gray and cold when I think about them. Fire looms large in many of my novels. Arson is the theme of burn marks. Flames of all kinds are burning through bleeding Kansas. And V.I. and a Catholic nun are both damaged in a terrible fire in my current novel, Hardball. I fear the destruction of the self, of my self. And how much more completely can you be destroyed than by fire? We live in a time of great instability and uncertainty, dubbed sometimes the age of fear. At the same time that communication and education technologies are changing radically, we're kept on edge by the threat of terrorism and by the hysteria induced by the 24-hour news cycle. There are days when the frenzied rhetoric of Glenn Beck or the Huffington Post exhaust me. I can't cope with high-voltage screeching about creeping socialism, oil spills, high unemployment, Tiger Woods, abortion threats, volcanic ash, earthquakes, terrorism, and Sandra Bullock's marriage all jumbled together in an insistent 24-hour scream. I wonder if today's vampires aren't a reaction to the age of fear and the age of clamor. Relations with vampires are rickety by nature. Vampires are powerful. They can be violent. But unlike Dracula, the modern vampire is usually gentle, undemanding sexually, as he is in the Twilight series. Or he's trying to create a circle of vampire friends to ease the loneliness of his plight, as is the Stade de Lioncourt in the Anne Rice books. Edward Cullen, in Twilight, could annihilate you physically or emotionally, but he chooses not to. Fiction can be a place of retreat into Edward Cullen's protective arms, but it can also be a place where you get reliable information. I don't mean that it tells you the truth about Obama, George Bush, Tiger Woods, or climate change. But fiction gives you emotional lodestars that help you develop your own moral compass and your own ability to sort truth from lies. This happened in my own life as I escaped and made sense of my childhood, largely with the help of books and with my own stories. Growing up in the country, I did, leave an, did live an isolated life. And like many people in such circumstances, I turned from that loneliness to the world of books. I started writing as a young child stories that reflected the fantasy worlds into which books helped me escape. In adolescence, I discovered the world of English crime novels. Peter Whimsey and Albert Campion were particularly beguiling because they dwelt in a land of manners, wealth, and especially of order. It was the orderliness, the good manners, the elegant repartee that I coveted, not the puzzles that Campion or Whimsy solved. From the age of about 13 on, I read crime novels in preference to almost any other kind of book. Uh, in fact, so much so that when I took my orals here in the history department back in the 1970s, I holed up in the library and read some two dozen crime novels the month before my exams. <laughs> That's why not a lot of people know about my PhD. I had to sign an affidavit promising I would never use it to teach in the continental United States. <laughs> <laughs> well, I became a more sophisticated reader. I discovered that the lives of women in fiction were as much, if not more, limited than my own. Broadly speaking, women in the mystery have been the inconstant, deceptive, manipulative monsters of whom the archetype is Bridget O'Shaughnessy in the Maltese Falcon. Mm -hmm. Or they have been the innocent, virginal types who get themselves in a peck of trouble and are rescued by a male hero. Even Harriet Vane and the combined female intelligences of Shrewsbury College need Peter Whimsey to rescue them, and Dorothy Sayers considered herself a feminist. 
Crime fiction throughout much of its 150-year history defined women by their sexual behavior. Good girls were chaste, bad girls were not. Chaste girls could not act effectively. Starting with Lady Audley's Secret, published by Mary Elizabeth Braddon in 1862, bad girls could act, but they were only able to commit evil deeds. Notable 20th century heroines include Carmen Sternwood of Raymond Chandler's The Big Sleep. The first time Carmen sees Philip Marlowe in the hallway of her father's house, she greets him as you or I might welcome a stranger. Marlowe tells us, she turned her body slowly and lightly without lifting her feet. Her arms dropped limp at her sides. She tilted herself forward towards me on her toes. She fell straight back into my arms. I had to catch her or let her crack her head on the tessellated floor. I caught her under her arms and she went rubber-legged on me instantly. I had to hold her close to hold her up. When her head was against my chest, she screwed it around and giggled at me. Now, don't try this maneuver at home without adult supervision or a good chiropractor on call. Of course, some women in crime fiction defied those stereotypes. Georgia Strangeways, Nicholas Blake's explorer hero, is resilient and resourceful in his 1939 novel, The Smiler with the Ninth. Perhaps the most defiant woman of all, in a cheerful, jello-eating kind of way, was Nancy Drew. Nancy was beautiful, she was poised, she was skilled in every art known to man or woman. She could grapple as easily with a broken down car or the law of the lever as she could with ballroom dancing. She possessed independence, money, and the things that money can buy, like a sporty roadster. She was the ringleader of her set and was known as much for her charity as for her quick wits. Nancy lacked only two things, domestic responsibilities and siblings. Although Nancy is in many ways an admirable model for young girls, everything came so easily to her that as a child, I couldn't identify with her. The heroines I turned to, who consoled me, and gave me space in the private room of my mind, battled against the limiting odds of female experience. They were usually plain. They were buried under Cinderella like mountains of domestic chores, as I was. They were poor, and they were told again, as I was, that the work they aspired to was a closed door to girls. They triumphed despite these obstacles, but the price they paid was often high. I guess female heroes had to be Joan of Arc to engage my sympathy, raise the siege of Orleans, crown the Dauphin, die by fire. I grew up in a time and place, and above all in a family that operated on the lines of the old-fashioned patriarchy, what the Victorians called the angel in the house. This is the formal name for an unnatural vision of women described by Coventry Patmore in his 1854 eulogy to his wife's self-abnegating nature. Even without Patmore's name for her, this angel has blighted women's lives for a long time. He for God only, Milton wrote of Adam and Eve, she for God in him. The struggle with the angel was a constant for 19th century women in a world Whereas Martha let us see earlier, uh, women's roles were very narrowly defined. Victorian writers sought ways either to retreat from these definitions or to find other sources of nurture and recognition. Illness was one escape route. Taking to bed seemed to be a useful strategy for some artists trying to avoid a life of domestic slavery. Elizabeth Barrett Browning did it until she met Robert and was able to get to her feet, move to Italy, and become active in anti-slavery and other liberation movements while continuing to grow in her art. Emily Dickinson avoided suitors and domestic responsibilities by hiding in cupboards. The great writer-explorer Isabella Bird was always so ill in her parents' Edinburgh house that she couldn't get out of bed. At the age of 40, she traveled to America and spent three years as an energetic explorer, 
She rode the transcontinental railroad on its maiden voyage, climbed up on the roof to shoot would-be train robbers, and camped out in the Rockies. She wrote up her adventures in a book called A Lady's Life in the Rocky Mountains and returned to her parents, whereupon she immediately became so ill that she had to retire to her bed until the time came again to, aboard, to board a transoceanic steamer, this time headed for the South Seas. Bedridden, Isabella Bird died at home at the age of 73. If she'd headed for Antarctica, she might have lived another 20 years. I've always admired the enterprise of these pioneering women. Women's estate has changed enormously from my own childhood. A few basics. Adult women don't need their husbands or fathers or brothers to co-sign their financial instruments. That was a requirement in 1964. Although 46 states, including Illinois, restrict access to contraception, and only 12% of counties in the U.S. have an abortion provider, both are still legal. In 1964, contraception was against the law for single women, and married women often had to plead a case for using contraception in front of a tribunal of doctors, <coughs> while abortion was illegal for all women. Women in 1964 earned an average of 59 cents for every dollar a man made for doing the same work. 46 years later, that average has risen by 16 cents to 75. If we keep moving at this heady rate, by the time my granddaughter is 87, she'll see pay equity. Uh, may I say big whoop? The pay gap actually varies quite a bit. One year out of college, women earn about 80% of what men make for doing the same job. Three years out, the gap widens to 75%. Senior executives and professional women make about 58 cents on the male dollar. This doesn't count the 16 CEOs that Bloomberg had identified yesterday, but the tier below them who usually operate outside public radar. In upper management ranks, women face a particularly vicious double bind. If they don't have a killer instinct, if they aren't willing to crush opponents on the way to the top, they're told they aren't strong enough for top management. If they're too assertive, they're told that they're too aggressive to be team players. In fact, there's an informal 12-step program for women executives called Bully Broad Camp to teach assertive women managers to be more gentle and feminine. I somehow can't imagine Rahm Emanuel or Dick Cheney <laughs> being sent to bully bastards camp. <laughs> Their bullying ways are seen as signs of macho effectiveness. If I was going to name one woman who would be voted most likely to need bully broad camp, it would be Hillary Rodham Clinton. If you can bear to revisit the endless presidential primaries of 2007, 2008, do you remember the way media, big and small, reacted to Hillary? MSNBC, which for reasons I don't understand has been labeled a liberal leaning network, was brutal. It was on MSNBC that Newsweek reporter Howard Feynman referred to Hillary as, quote, this thing. He said, the Democratic Party needs to step in and stop this thing. To which Keith Oberman replied, right. Somebody who can take her into a room and only he comes out. Some man should take Hillary into a room and kill her. It was okay to say this out loud on national television because, as Tucker Carlson said, also on MSNBC, Hillary was castrating. And believe me, these guys sounded gentle compared to the boys on Fox. So we've made a lot of gains, we women, but we still have a distance to travel. We have a way to go before our country thinks we're adults, before it values the work we do in the same way it does the work men do. And we have a ways to go before we can speak in public, occupy that public space without Keith Oberman and Bill O'Reilly
threatening to rape and murder us. Gina Davis, who started an institute on women in the media, commissioned a report by the Annenberg School for Communications. Some of their findings, women get about 20% of, sorry, women get about 27% of movie roles, a fraction that's remained constant over the last three decades. If a group of people is talking on screen, only one in that group can be a woman. In general, men speak 72% of all lines of dialogue. No matter whether a movie is rated X or G, women are bone thin and wear very little between neck and knee. The motion picture rating guide is based on sex, so a movie can get a PG rating if a woman is brutally assaulted with all details shown, as long as no one is having sex. Cartoonist Alison Bechtel did a strip some years back in which one of her dykes to watch out for says, I only go to a movie if it meets three basic requirements. There are at least two women in it with names. They talk to each other, and they talk about something besides a man. And then she adds the last movie she was able to watch was Alien, although the women in it were talking about a monster. <laughs> This strip has recently been recast as a video, which is making the rounds these days on YouTube. And some of the comments on what kind of castrating bitch would put out a video like this are truly eye-popping. Chicago crime writer Kevin Guilfoyle applied the Bechdel test to crime fiction. He says about 30% of novels, crime novels, meet the test. That is, in over two-thirds of contemporary crime fiction, there are either no women, or their role is as victim, or as foil to the male hero. In much of what I read, women continue to be either victims of murders whose gruesomeness and descriptions get more violent and graphic every month, or we are worried nurturers on the sidelines of the action hero's life, as is Susan Silverman in the Spencer novels. My first book, Indemnity Only, was published in 1982. In the years since then, we have seen enormous change in the crime novel. Whereas it took me almost a year to find a publisher willing to take a chance on a woman detective in America's third largest city, we now have so many books with women heroes that I can't keep track of them all. Women now routinely review books in places like the New York Times, and our books are routinely reviewed there. In 1982, it was still rare for high prestige publications to look at work by women. At the same time, books and movies still all too often look at us only in the tired old ways. In the last few decades, as women's voices have grown stronger, the punishment of active women has also increased, at least in fiction. Women may have to be killed, strong women, as happens in Scott Turow's Presumed Innocent, where the only woman who isn't punished for her sexuality is a paraplegic. Or they may have to be brutalized, as Karen Winterman was in Haywood Gould's Double Bang. The sadism has been a growth industry Despite the many welcome changes of the last few decades, we are bombarded with books, movies, songs, and above all, video games, which show women being violated in horrific ways. These run the gamut from mainstream films, where women's chief role is as prostitute, witness the successful re-release of Sharon Stone's Basic Instinct in 2006, which includes what some reviewers call, quote, the classic film moment of Sharon Stone's spread-legged interrogation to video games where players can rape, maim, and kill misbehaving prostitutes. In Rising, sorry, in Rising Sun, the action turns on the murder of a woman who engages in masochistic sex. In the movie version, we are repeatedly shown a video both of the masochism and her murder. In review after review, papers and magazines brooded on the negative image the movie gave, gave us of the Japanese, but none of them mentioned the degradation of the murder victim. 
We take women's rape and dismemberment for granted as an essential part of action films. Like the prostitute who cheers up Clark, Clark Gable in Gone with the Wind, in fiction and in film, the woman who understands that she really is a prostitute is a contented animal. She's happy to be able to have this kind of easy camaraderie with men through her body. She's a beloved figure in con contemporary fiction, as Robert Parker's widely praised Hooker in Distress, April Kyle, demonstrates. In Roberto Bolliano's Savage Detectives, winner of many literary prizes and hailed as, quote, the first literary masterpiece of the 21st century. The protagonist goes to a bar in Mexico City as a young man, as a young teenager, where the nameless whores gently and lovingly initiate him into sexual manhood. Yes, I thought when I read this, revolutionary, mind-changing, welcome to the 21st century. These depictions are very remote from reality. Most American sex workers were sexually abused as children and become prostitutes because they were conditioned as children to believe that they existed only in the body. The United States has the highest rate of rape of any country that reports such data. Our rape rate is four times that of West Germany, the country in second place. Of the nearly 800,000 women who suffer rape each year in America, one in eight is under the age of 12. Almost half are under the age of 18. Glamorizing prostitution in books and movies, presenting young girls as sexually available in commercials and on screen does not help this situation. And another strange development of the contemporary mystery, most of the successful women detectives are incredibly thin. We're so focused on America's obesity epidemic that we don't notice, or we may even praise, the women who are trying to disappear. They starve themselves, or they take heroin or synthroid in order to be bone thin, or they work out obsessively so they won't take up any space. If they can't disappear altogether, they may dress in little girl clothes, a submissive gesture that says, I'm not an adult presence. I'm not really a threat to you. In the contemporary crime novels, many women heroes, including Sue Grafton's quite wonderful Kinsey Milhone, are described as five foot six and weighing 118 pounds. I don't know how 118 became normative but it's a recurring weight. These heroines are called big in books by both men and women. Now, I'm 5'6", and I weigh a little more than 130 pounds. I think if I dropped 15 pounds, no one would think I was big. They would think I needed an intervention. <laughs> when I started writing Indemnity Only, I hoped my vision would be part of the work that would forever change women's lives. I understand now, though, that there are many kinds of radicalism. Only one of them is my wish for a world in which women are not judged by the content and shape of our anatomy, so to speak, but by the quality of our work and the ardor of our dreams. Against that vision is an angry radicalism that wants us forever boxed in by our anatomy. I hope it is my vision that will prevail, but I have no crystal ball. I can't predict what will survive. I'm past 60 now. I don't have, as Tennyson put it, the strength which in old days moved heaven and earth. All I have is hope, hope in the young women coming after me, hope and my writer's voice, which I came to in a hard way. They will have to be enough to give me strength for the journey. Thank you very much. Okay, so now the plan is we're each, each of the others of us will make a couple of brief 
comments or, or pose questions to Sarah, and then we'll just have a conversation with Sarah replying. And, and of course, thank you for that, that marvelous talk. And then uh, after about 15 minutes, we'll throw it open to the audience. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll start. But first of all, I want to say that I, I also identified with Joan of Arc. In fact, my first performance on stage uh, in sixth grade, I was Joan of Arc, and I, I really did love doing that. Um, that was great. It was Joan of Arc as a child, so I, I think that was important. But, um, but she didn't have a sense of humor, so that was a problem. Um, but anyway, um, I guess what I've been thinking about working on this conference and then hearing you is how um, it seems that things have gotten so much worse in the literary world because here we are dealing with a period where uh, at least, um, I mean, of course, there were wonderful uh, women who were writing novels, but also the men were seriously interested in the problems of women and showed respect for women in the way they wrote. And Richardson, Trollope, I think Wilkie Collins, I would count in that category, but, and, and Shaw. I mean, these are men who grappled in a seri serious ways with the, the social limitations facing women. And, you know, if you turn to the contemporary American novel, the, the, the names that shoot out when people discuss the Nobel Prize, et cetera, are Bellow, Roth, Updike, and, you know, who are all so misogynistic that I have great difficulty reading them. Uh, and of course, Joyce Oates uh, gets treated to the backslap of that. I mean, that she gets demeaned and run down because she's so preoccupied with women's issues. Um, I was very glad to see the very good article about her in the latest New York Review of Books. Oh, Mailer is another one we could mention in this company. And I guess in the detective uh, novel, uh, you're really, I mean, you and, and maybe Sue Grafton are, are alone. I mean, it, it's a very misogynistic genre still. I think a little bit better of Susan Silverman than you do, maybe, because at least she does have an independent career, and she's a, a woman of substance. And clearly, both the author and the character are in love with her. So there's something to be said for, for Susan. So, um, but, but on the whole, things are pretty grim. And I, I'm glad I spend most of my time reading novelists from the period that we're <laughs> discussing. Um, so I, I, I guess I'd like you to to the comment. I mean, it's something about American definitions of manhood that you can't really be understood as a dominant male novelist unless you're a misogynist. It, it almost seems that way sometimes. Um, but now I'll, I'll pass the mic to, to Nikki Lacey, who, whose book on women, crime, and character started off this whole show. So I, I should just explain that we all had to pass the Joan of Arc test we got onto this panel. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Sarah. I, I'm just going to... Um, what really strikes me about your remarks, actually, is that as our writer, our novelist here, you're the person who's actually put the position of the reader of the novel most at issue during the day. And um, so I've just been sitting, as I was listening to you, I was thinking about, in ways I never have before, and I'm really talking just out of that reaction, about what brought me to novels as a, as a child. And um, very similarly, I, I, I didn't, Joan of Arc wasn't it, but Dorothea, the word ardor was definitely there. And it was ardent and rebellious women, characters in novels, who I identified with as an only child who was a voracious reader. The only child of two people who had not had the privilege of education and who were tremendous autodidacts, but who therefore thought that novels were sort of for pleasure and that one should be reading history and biography. Now, of course, this sent me right off for the novels <laughs> because the novels were mine. <laughs> and as long as they were something my mother approved of as decent literature, um, that was, you know, that was okay because it was reading. Um, now, um, I did, I, I, I never, you've helped me understand why I never took to crime fiction. I just felt that crime fiction, until I much later uh, found your books, wasn't, wasn't anything about me. And I think that was, although this was in a pre, you know, pre-consciously feminist phase of my existence, I think it was precisely that I just felt incredibly angry about, and also quite bored by, um, that, that very male 
world in which women were, were bit players or victims, and I didn't intend at that stage to become a victim. But when I think back to what, what um, those novels gave me as a teenager, um, it was escape, it was company as an only child, it was a world of imagination. And yes, it was definitely, your, your point about reassurance definitely resonated for me, that these, these books were a complete world. And I, I'm going to run off and read um, the, the Brady's book about the relationship one's, one forms as a reader with the characters in the novel, because I still struggle today with finishing novels where I really love the characters. I actually go through quite a difficult day and I start reading more slowly and getting quite anxious about <coughs> the novel. But just the final uh, thing I want to say is really sort of making a connection from that very personal experience as a reader to what has brought many of us here to this conference, which is as people who have also used these literary creations in our academic work. And I, I um, listening to you, Sarah, and thinking about it today, understood better why it's taken me a very long time to come to law and literature, which as somebody who really would have loved to have studied English but was persuaded out of it, <laughs> would have been an obvious thing for me to do as a serial breaker of disciplinary boundaries in the legal academy. But I didn't do it, and I think it was because that world of the novel was a, has always been a very safe and private world for me. And I almost didn't want it mixed up with my career. Um, but hey, it's too late now, I've done it. <laughs> and how I, how I got to do it was a serendipity, which maybe I'll talk about tomorrow. So, But thanks so much for those comments. Well, let's see how this I just have a couple of things. So I guess my modal historical entry figure, um, probably Elizabeth I and Laura Ingalls Wilder, so some strange combination of Anglophilia, oh, and Mary Queen of Scots, so and Scottish nationalism, romantic nationalism, and American exceptionalism. So, but yeah, we, I think any person, especially a woman, likes to read and likes novels has that, that person, her past, that historical figure, and then onto the novels. Um, I guess I just have a couple, two things really. One is when I think about um, detective novels in particular, one of the things I think is interesting, and it seems to me to be a recent development, is the number of detective novels that are re relatively popular that are about women and female detectives, but set in other countries, but then sort of read widely or with a kind of cult following in the United States. So. And one of these, I guess, is books, but also a TV series. So Prime Suspect with Helen Mirren as Detective Chief Inspector Jane Tennyson, where I, it's a series that's been going on for some I think, 15 or 20 years. And the gender issues are always front and center. And then you also have the comparative, ooh, it's different in England feeling, um, <laughs> which I don't know. I think is a kind of heady mix that, that people really seem to respond to. And then there are other kind of series like this. So there's a. Um, series by the author Cara Black, who I think is American, but they're all set in Paris and around France. Um, and then she's actually from San Francisco. Oh, God. <laughs> so really far. From her. Um, and then uh, there's a I think Swedish author Helene Thurston, with a couple that I've read. And then finally Stieg Larsson, who I think kind of maybe problematically, maybe in a voyeuristic way, or maybe not, is a male author with. Girl with the Dragon Tattoo and some other recent ones that are sort of about these questions, but I think especially in the movie version, and Martha and I have talked about this, raise these questions of the kind of, is the violence that's being depicted voyeuristic at some level? Um, so that's a kind of women and female detectives in other cultures perhaps as somehow revealing something um, about these questions that people find interesting and also the comparative angle. Um, and then finally, another sort of data point, I guess, is the Booker Prize. So. Last year, I'm in this sort of informal group where we read the, the shortlist of novels. Last year, six on the shortlist, only one by a woman. And I think our group universally agreed it was our least favorite. And then we felt like, well, you know, I guess they felt like they had to have a female author, but gee, this doesn't seem like a great uh, situation that was everyone's least favorite in a group of women reading. Um, this year, though, I think the list, the shortlist was half women authors. 
the ultimate winner, Hilary Mantle, a woman, with a biography of Thomas Cromwell, a kind of hard man of the Tudor era, and then another highly acclaimed one on the list by A.S. Byatt, which many people regarded as a kind of ninth, return to the 19th century novel. Um, so I guess one year ago, sad prospect in the Booker, this year looking better, but interestingly a kind of recovery of the 19th century novel and the historical biography. Um, so I guess those are just a few kind of thoughts that your really fascinating comments raised for me and things we could think about as kind of shedding light on this question of women as authors and readers. Well, first of all, I'm really delighted to know that Wolf Hall won the Booker. I hadn't been tracking that. I thought that book was riveting. It's, that's a book that I really wish I had written, had, had the insight and skill. And it's just an amazing novel. It's my answer to every question I get asked these days about books. Wolf Hall, Wolf Hall, Wolf Hall. Um, do you have to be a misogynist to be a novelist or a crime novelist? I think because I was trying to keep my remarks relatively short, I was focusing on some particular issues about speech and silence and taking up space that really occupy my mind. I think there are, are kind of two arteries right now that are two broad broad visions of women, I and mean, with many, many nooks and crannies and subdivisions and vessels and whatever, to mix all my metaphors, coming out of them. But one of them, which is, I think, really in reaction to the success of women in the last 40 years in the public sphere, which is just furious and, and vehement in its, its desire to flay and to destroy women. And the other, a vision of women as flawed, but, but real human beings who are navigating that space. A woman named Monica Franzen collected cartoons about women and women's suffrage in a book called Make Way. And what it showed was that, you know, women have been operating in the public sphere for as long as there's been women and there's been a public sphere. And, Women served in the Civil War disguised as men. Women worked in the cotton fields in the South, in the factories in the North. They, they did many, many different jobs. But it wasn't until they began agitating in a widespread way, agitating for suffrage, that they were depicted in crude and demeaning ways. So as long as they were content to be outside the decision-making part of the public sphere. They could be female, feminine, protected. As soon as they started agitating for suffrage, they were depicted as ravening monsters. And they had to be destroyed. I think the same thing is, is, has happened with the depiction of women in, in fiction and in crime fiction and in film. Some of it, of course, is the stakes keep getting raised. As soon as you stopped having obscenity laws that, that blocked off the pornographic aspect of, of fiction and film from mainstream audiences. The stakes keep getting raised. People get inured to this level of gore and need this level of gore. But some of it is because ever since Title VII legislation, women have been trying to take up more public space that was previously not their domain. You know, I started work in management at CNA Insurance in 1977, shortly after CNA had been put under a Department of Justice consent decree about the number of women in, in management. We had, like all insurance companies, the bulk of our workforce was female, but it was all clerical. As soon as you started wanting to see women actually in decision-making positions, then the view of, of who we are and what we were doing changed radically. I had bosses who were wonderful mentors and really supported women in the, navigating those shoals. But man, the head of my department, he used to bet with his, his uh, buddies on how long it would take him to reduce a woman to tears if she was making a presentation to the chairman. So it's these two things. I don't think you have to be a misogynist or write misogynistically, but but the ferocity of the, of the rage against women is, is really uh, 
palpable in some of these movies, video games, and, and even in fiction, and in fiction written by women, as far as that goes. And on the internet, I would add, we, we had a conference uh, two years, well, a year and a half ago, about um, the, well, which largely concerned the pornographic abuse of women on the internet, and it's coming out as a book now. And there, I mean, I think it's very much what you say, that these, uh, there was this site that many of the papers discussed uh, that, that Brian Leiter was very uh, involved in exposing and bringing to some measure of justice. And it purported to give information about law school, but what it really did was create a space where anonymously people could post pornographic uh, slurs against named women, and then they gave instructions on how to get it onto Google on the first page of the thing of that person's name, so that when the, the woman would apply for a job, then that would come up. And so uh, some of these women really failed to get jobs because of that. But uh, you know what I said in my paper uh, about this was that I think it is the creation of a of a kind of counter world. I, uh, I was trying to draw Nietzsche's uh, idea of ressentiment that out of the the anger at being having the competition to, to deal with, uh, these men find a way. And it turned out that the ones who were able to be traced were rather powerless, sort of failure mm -hmm. people, uh, and they they found a way to create a world in which they dominate the woman. They can make her do whatever she wants, and and then of course. It, all the better for them. It has spillover effects in the so-called real world. So, uh, so I do think that the internet makes that uh, anonymous targeting uh, very easy. Yeah, it's, a, it's sort of a frightening aspect of the, about of the world wide web. Um, Joan of Arc. Next year, maybe you'll do Shaw's Joan of Arc for you. <laughs> <on the internet. laughs> The interrogation of Joan of Arc is a, is a really interesting subject. It, it highlights some of the difficulties with, with interrogation in general because of all medieval trials, hers is perhaps the most thoroughly documented, and yet who knows what really happened there. The way the questions are written down, the way the answers are written down, is no different in a way than in a contemporary police interrogation, who controls the camera, what are the camera angles, what is the witness really, or the, the, the crime suspect, or whoever really saying. It's the relationship between law and fiction, I'm ignorant obviously of a lot of the technicalities of law, but I think the two are very closely entwined and that it's not so strange that you jump to the light side from the dark side <laughs> um, because it's who's telling the story, how well do they tell the story, after all, that, that becomes the law. Uh, it also depends, of course, on, on who the editor and publisher are. If, if our former professor of constitutional law is the main publisher of editor of opinions in society, then it does color how the law gets written, um, but that's another subject for another day. I think there was one other thing I wanted to say about that, not about law and fiction, although I was once on a trial, I was once a member of a jury in a, in a very minor civil lawsuit that took 10 years, as it does in Cook County, to come to court, and we sat and listened, and the poor uh, plaintiffs were represented. It was a guy, it was his very first day in court, and the defense lawyer was quite an experienced insurance lawyer, and the judge was elderly and kept falling asleep, and the plaintiff's attorney couldn't make himself heard when he had an objection, and the defense lawyer was able to say, I object loudly, and the judge would wake up and sustain his objections. <laughs> so um, how you present your story definitely does affect the outcome. Actually, I think it's time to take some questions from the audience. I think we have probably have about 10 to 15 minutes for questions. Yeah, Rouse. So, Sarah, I wanted to ask you how it has been to write over the course of VI's life or career as more, uh, you know, fiction by women about female detective or a detective-like figures has, um, you know, increased in, in ways that, in some sense, trivialise the themes you've always been working with. So, you know, Janet Ivanovich's novels in some ways very entertaining, very engaging, and they have a very kind of feminist light vision of female agency and equality. And you know, I wonder how 
if that has made it you know, more challenging or interesting or how it's shaped your thinking about VI is the parallel stories of a different vision of agency inequality that certainly doesn't have the serious social justice or struggle dimension to your stories. Uh, the question had to deal with how has the emergence of so very many women crime writers with, with strong women characters affected how I write and how I see my character. I think it's great, I love it. Um, I never wanted to be the only player in the room. I think the issues have, have changed. Uh, when I started writing, you know, the first thing that, that someone might ask is, is as, as uh, the title of P.D. James' book about her woman, Private Eye, says, is it a suitable job for a woman? Are you up to the weight? Can you do the job? It would be ludicrous for that to continue to be asked in today's world. Uh, the year my first book was published was the first year that women in Chicago could be members of the regular police force instead of just matrons dealing with, with juries and women in detention. And um, some of you may remember across the country, not just here, that w wives of, of, office, of male officers would riot and stage protests because they thought in the first place that women would be having affairs with their husbands and in the second place that women wouldn't back up the guys. Nobody even thinks about that anymore. Women have really shown that, that they can pull their weight in that world. So the, the, I think in some way, sometimes I think I'm just a tired old cranky Tyrannosaurus who is still obsessed with these issues of women and justice and speech and silence, and that uh, the second generation, so to speak, of women writing about these characters has been able to write maybe more freely, more lightly than I've been able to do. Um, or maybe it's just my personality, this kind of Eastern European, heavy-headed Jewish kind of affect. What can I say? <laughs> Yes, in the back. I was wondering if you'd like to say a few words about science fiction. We're talking about forward-looking things and how things might change. I just finished a science fiction course. All the females are sort of soft-shouldered and doe-eyed, always available, always waiting for the guy to land on Mars to be there for them and this kind of thing. And I think, you know, science fiction in a way sort of kind of it's, it's a little bit about us and who we are in our future. and. Um, not a, very good, <laughs> not a very good model, you know, the uh, Princess of Mars comes to mind, you know, these sorts of tales. And there was one that I read that was, I must be harder than diamond, I can't remember the author. The, the, the heroine had celebrated her 40th uh, wedding anniversary, so she had to be at least 60, and she was absolutely fantastic, back to Senator off. Uh, you know, just kind of like ruled the whole uh, the whole story, but it was rare. I mean, that was the exception. Uh, the the comment had to do with the depiction of women in science fiction, and sadly, I can't comment on it because it's it's a form that I really don't read much. But uh, you do have writers like Philip Pullman creating quite wonderful young women characters, and and so maybe I'll just keep reading him and forget Princess of Mars. But yeah, I, I just want to add that I think, I mean, uh, because it's only through uh, an occasional partner that I ever came in contact with science fiction, uh, you know, and I came to the conclusion that it's really written for teenage boys and the, 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 the people who, you know, it's found appealing to people who are still at some level teenage boys, but, but it, it has this extremely immature and psychologically flat uh, understanding of it, so I, I agree with that. Uh, yeah, so. Um, oh, I love your affect. Your you know, <laughs> feminist curmudgeonly outrage. I love it. And um, but I want to uh, ask about a, a few things that you, uh, a few issues you raise. So um, I, you know, we, when we turn off NCIS, there's nothing to watch but zombies. Uh, I mean, the whole NCIS, you know, CSI franchise to me is all about you know the splaying and playing of the female body, and there's the obligatory. Um, seen in the in the uh, uh, um, you know, what do you call it the morgue, morgue yeah. you know where the body is there and they're picking it apart and 
Um, and the Dexter, the, the cable, you know, the new cable show about the serial killer who's a, basically a CIA, a CSI, a scientist is really amps up that angle of that particular logic. So I can't, I actually can't watch those shows. Um, and then the zombie stuff I can't watch because uh, to me, to my mind, the whole Twilight franchise is, is this abstinence porn that's all about, like, uh, so like, I don't know, like dra va vampires used to be about sexuality and now they're about, you know, repression and, you know, abstinence and virginity and I just can't stand it. And so, you, you know, you, you end with saying, I don't want to just be a body and I'm like, I want more bodies. Like, oh, what's with the vampires that don't have sex with, you know, instead? So, um, so then that brings me to basic instinct. Which, uh, when I, so I was flipping channels recently and, and it was on cable and I watched it for the first time since it came out. And, um, uh, and uh, I'd forgotten that it was a rewriting or rethinking of Vertigo, which is very self conscious. She's got the whole Kim, Kim Novak, you know, suit and hairstyle. And, um, but, it's, but she's killing the men because they uh, want to have children, it seems. Uh, I mean, that's how the, the final scene ends. She doesn't kill him then because he says, okay, maybe we don't have to have, maybe we don't have to, he says, like, some, he has some, like, we should just, you know, uh, buy a white picket, house with a white picket fence and make babies or something. And she goes to reach for the ice pick, and then he's like, okay, okay, maybe we don't have to do that. And she puts it down. <laughs> so, um, I mean, and so there, there's, the, there's their bodies, their sexuality. It's true that, that, that feminine sexuality seems killing. On the other hand, uh, what's, what, it's in the service of a certain kind of feminist logic that has to do with <laughs> resisting the notion that that sexuality should be in the service of. Um, well, I think the antidote for all these kinds of, of shows and books and so on is Babette Cole's Princess Smarty Pants in which um, Princess Smarty Pants is, she's being wooed because she has a, a queendom to inherit and that somebody wants to, to take over the inheritance and so on. And so she sets them all of these impossible tasks and they all fail at them. And then finally along comes a prince who does them all. He goes into the moat, the, the moat fights off the moat monsters, retrieves the ring, does all the other things and uh, says, okay, I've done them all, I've succeeded, I've won your hand in marriage. And the Princess Smarty Pants looks at the moat monster who's sunning himself next to her chaise long of the palace grounds and says, eh, I don't want to marry you anyway. And uh, they throw him back in the moat. And the last scene is Princess Smarty Pants and the moat monster happily sitting there. Now this is a children's book, so I assume they're not margaritas, but they did look an awful lot like margaritas. <laughs> to me as the adult reader. And Babette Cole, wow, I was on tour once. I was a week behind her. I am so dull on tour. I, you know, I do my thing, I go to bed, and I get a grumpy kitchen ear. And Babette Cole, they told me she wore leopard print, skin tight uh, spandex, and that she had to be taken to bars to dance the lambada until four in the morning. So. Um, don't look at me, don't look at V.I., look at Babette Cole and Princess Smarty Pants. The movies, and it seems all the, all the bad zombies are all the guys. Hmm, hmm, I, I have to confess I have not watched, I've not, I've just flipped through them. And I obviously shouldn't have stopped at NCIS where, of course, Ziva, who I, you know, I'm not immune to these things. I want to be Ziva. I want to be able to quickly kill two would-be assassins all the time looking drop-dead gorgeous and um, it was not meant to be though. Uh, but clearly I need to stop serving through the zombie movies and sit and pay attention to them. I think that you're right, zombies good, vampires bad, at least in their contemporary. But there's always Buffy. <laughs> Well, on that note, I think we can adjourn to the reception and have more informal conversation with Sarah. But well, thank you very much. And thank you for coming to the Rocks. Maybe in addition to the MBA and the PhD. And what did you do?